Dinosaurs are not extinct. I almost got eaten by one, but I got away. Most of you think I'm either lying or I've invented time travel. But the truth is that I saw it inside virtual reality, or VR. VR is a technology that transports your mind to places that exist inside a computer. You strap a small screen over your eyes that makes it feel like you're inside a video game where you can look around and interact with a 360-degree, three-dimensional environment. It allows us to visualize anything in our imagination. VR itself is not so new, actually. It's existed in military research labs, but it was too expensive and made people feel motion sick. But in 2012, VR finally seemed ready for mainstream consumer adoption when I saw a Kickstarter for the Oculus Rift, a sci-fi-looking headset that promised to take me inside video games. And as a young boy obsessed with the world in my Game Boy Advance, I did what any kid would do. I bugged my mom. We had to get one. She thought the Rift was just a gaming accessory, but I knew it was much more. This was the next major computing platform, the coolest thing ever. And yet, I grew frustrated that none of my friends were as excited about it as I was. So a year and a half ago, I created a meetup called VRLA, or Virtual Reality Los Angeles, to find people who cared about VR. Our first event hosted 100 people and a dozen virtual reality companies that gave demos and presentations. This is a guy who just got his world rocked by VR at our first event. Since then, I assembled an incredible team to help grow the event. And after six shows, we're now the largest expo for VR in the world with over 2,000 attendees at the LA Convention Center a few months ago. I feel incredibly lucky to see the work of nearly every major VR company before it's released. Our exhibitors are letting you float in outer space, drive a race car, and even fly over mountains. We see so many smiles at VRLA. People have so much fun because as far as our brains are concerned, virtual reality is real. It's just not physical. And that's an important distinction I learned from Dr. Todd Richmond, director of advanced prototype development at USC's Institute for Creative Technology. VR experiences reinforce a long-held idea about the nature of consciousness, that our brains are really good inference machines that construct reality from multiple streams of information coming from our five senses. Presented with the right information in theory, our brains would not be able to tell the difference between the physical reality and virtual reality. As my friend Johnny Ross told me, we've lived in a world with two natural states of consciousness up till now. We're either asleep and dreaming, or we're either awake. VR exists at the intersection of these two states, creating a new third state of consciousness. Language fails to fully explain what VR is like. You just have to try it. But if you've ever had a lucid dream before, you might be able to imagine what it's like. A year ago, I had an incredible lucid dream where I walked around and it felt like I was actually moving my legs. And this was pretty weird because I knew I was in a dream, and yet I could visualize my legs lying flat on my bed at home. I woke up excited because if it was possible to feel my entire body in a dream, it might be possible to do the same in virtual reality. Today, I'm going to paint a possible vision of the future for how we could get to full body presence inside virtual reality and consider some pretty wild implications it would entail. We know that head-mounted displays, like most technology, will get smaller, lighter, more comfortable, eventually becoming a slim pair of glasses. And yes, we'll all have bald gray heads in the future, too. We're already seeing devices like this. Microsoft's HoloLens is an augmented reality headset that overlays 3D objects onto your vision as if they were really there. AR supplements your sight by adding information on top of it, while VR replaces it entirely. And right now, these are two separate technologies, but it seems natural that they'll converge, maybe sooner than we think, as headsets become equipped with more sensors that can track our own body and the world around us, understanding them as our own brains do. 
the implications are astronomical. We'll enter an era of mixed reality popping in and out of AR and VR with a tap of a finger. We'll be able to play Minecraft in our living rooms or talk to our parents as if they were there in the room with us, face to face, even while they're thousands of miles away. Or relax on a beach to escape the boredom of a TED talk. The possibilities are endless. And these experiences will be increasingly immersive and engaging with graphics becoming so good that eventually virtual reality will be indistinguishable from physical reality. VR developers you might talk to will seem a little bit loopy ever since we had the realization that we're all building component parts of the matrix, a VR simulation that feels as real as the physical world. And once we master the art of tricking our senses of sight and hearing, we're going to want to bring all of our senses in there too for a completely immersive experience, just like my lucid dream. Today we create VR with external devices, but it seems like the best solution to making perfect VR is to do it from within the brain itself. And one way to get there is through radical innovation in brain-computer interfaces, nanotechnology, and artificial intelligence. Now, here's where this talk is going to get really weird and maybe a bit scary, because in order to talk about the future, I have to sound a bit crazy. J just think about it. If I were to tell you only three years ago that we would have virtual reality today, you would have called me crazy. <laughs> so who knows what else might happen in our lifetimes? The future is going to be fun. And what could be more fun than sticking computers in our brains? Well, it turns out 70% of Americans are not down for that yet. But that's not stopping DARPA, an agency of the US Department of Defense, from creating an implant called a cortical modem. This would display information directly into our vision by getting specific neurons to fire when stimulated with light. And this would be pretty incredible because if it works, we would never need screens again. Here we see one path to creating images from within the brain. But what about controlling these images? Neuroscientist Miguel Nicolelis recently implanted electrodes into the brains of three monkeys to capture and transmit their brain activity. Each monkey could control a virtual arm and had to work with each other to guide the arm to a moving target. This is a early example of brain-to-brain -brain communication, like he was talking about earlier. How crazy is that? While this research has a long way to go before being applied to virtual reality, it hints that controlling computers with our minds is at least possible. Nanotechnology is another potential avenue for creating VR from within the brain itself. Nanobots are theoretical, incredibly tiny machines, smaller than one millionth of a millimeter, so small that they could manipulate individual atoms to reconstruct matter itself. To give you a sense of just how small that is, if we shrunk the Earth down so that it was a one meter, one nanometer would be the size of a marble. Futurist Ray Kurzweil thinks that we could send nanobots through the capillaries in our brains to create virtual reality. They would be able to uh, simulate, uh, they would be able to read and write information directly to our neurons to simulate a rich, multi-sensory experience comparable to real life. OK, now, it's, it's unclear if this is indeed possible or not, but just for fun, let's imagine it is and see how far down the rabbit hole we can go. By mapping the position, molecular composition, and numerous connections of every neuron throughout the brain, some think that nanobots would allow us to upload our own minds to a computer. The recorded neurons and synapses would then be simulated in a software program to create a mind file of our consciousnesses that would experience life inside virtual reality. And once in there, artificial intelligence will connect those mind files to the internet and help design the worlds we experience in there. Now, to understand just how smart AI will be at this point, we can look at the three types of AI. Artificial narrow intelligence, artificial general intelligence, and artificial super intelligence. Now, today we have AI, which is really good at doing one specific thing, 
Siri, for example, can answer questions that fall within a limited predefined range, but ask her, like, uh, what is the meaning of life? And she won't give you a satisfying answer. And don't tell me you haven't asked her that. We all asked her that. <laughs> now imagine Siri that could give you a satisfying answer to any question that you would ask it. That's the promise of artificial general intelligence, or AGI. And Ava in the movie Ex Machina is a great example of AGI embodied in a robot. Similarly, in VR, AGI could take the form of a person to become the ultimate personal assistant. Developing artificial intelligence that can autonomously learn new tasks like a human will be incredibly difficult. But what if it happens sooner than we expect? When a group of hundreds of scientists were asked when we might have AGI, the median year was 2040. The law of accelerating returns, another Ray Kurzweil concept, says that information technology improves exponentially, meaning that computers are getting faster at an increasing rate. And to give you a sense of the power of exponential change, if I doubled a penny every day for 30 days, that would be over $5 million. And over 90% of that value was generated in the last five days alone. That's also a lot of pennies. Just think about what that could mean for consciousness in the context of VR. It's theorized that once we develop AGI, it would have the ability to harness exponential change, to recursively improve itself, turning into ASI in a matter of minutes to hours. ASI would be far smarter than anything we can imagine today, rupturing the narrative of human history itself. And if we visualize different levels of intelligence on a staircase, we could put like, you know, a worm on the bottom step, and then a dog, and then a, maybe a monkey, and then humans. And ASI would be all the way up here, or even higher, because of its ability to improve itself exponentially. Now, let's try to imagine for a moment what living alongside an ASI in virtual reality could be like. Have you ever had a really long dream that felt like you went on a journey for several days? The dreams where you wake up in a frustrated daze, like watching Polaroid pictures of a vacation developing in reverse, fading into white. Life could turn into something like this, where We'll explore fantastic virtual worlds for days on end, except we'll remember all of it. Unconstrained by the laws of physical reality, we could will our very imagination into existence to experience anything we want. But in a life of infinite abundance, where will we find purpose if we you know, essentially have the powers of a god? Our new purpose then might be to design and explore worlds together with the ASI. Some of us have this Star Trek vision of the future of developing super fast spaceships that would take us to meet alien civilizations in other galaxies. But maybe we'll travel through the internet itself, visiting websites as three-dimensional worlds, a sort of internet of worlds. For centuries, we've looked up at the stars and wondered, why? In the vastness of our universe, haven't we found life outside of our own? Why haven't we yet been visited by aliens? And this question is known as the Fermi paradox. And the most compelling answer that I found is known as the transcension hypothesis, developed by futurist John Smart, which argues that evolution guides all sufficiently intelligent civilizations to explore the inner world, not the outer world like we've all been led to believe by science fiction. Year over year, our technology gets faster, smaller, lighter, cheaper, more efficient. And if we look at these trends from a wider perspective, we'll see that technology is condensing inwards, not outwards, into an incredibly dense black hole-like point. This is the singularity, the moment we all transcend our physical bodies to live out infinite digital fantasies. This is the moment we've been waiting for, the prize of millions of years of evolution. Everything from the Big Bang until now has been leading up to this, and when we reach the singularity, we're going to have to ask ourselves if there's anything inherently valuable about the physical world over the virtual one. And after spending years in this incredible lucid dream, we may come to view 
the physical world and our life on earth as just another app we might choose to access. Now, it's easy to feel uncomfortable about this idea at first, but uh, what if this is not some dystopian future, but instead an incredibly positive thing for humans? John Carmack, one of the founders of Oculus, considers building virtual reality a moral imperative to democratize experience itself. I would agree. VR is like moving to the biggest city ever, broadening the possible range of experiences we can have. It widens our ability to imagine what's possible, forever changing our sense of just how malleable our reality could be. And when we can see life from each other's eyes, our capacity for empathy can only increase. We'll be more connected to each other than ever before. And so I wonder if VR might help us realize that separation was just an illusion all along. Thank you. <laughs>